This is the first of two videos that we're going to cover uh, studying subgroups of groups. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with the definition of a subgroup of a group. So let's suppose that G is a group and H is a subset of G that is itself a group under the same operation as our original group G. So that clause is very important. We need to be a subset and also a group ourselves under the same operation as the larger group. Uh, if this is satisfied, then the subset H is said to actually be a subgroup of the group G. So in all of mathematics, you find this sort of universal um, notation for sub something or another. So if you're dealing with some type of structure, and that structure has a whole bunch of properties, then you'll find that any arbitrary subset that satisfies the same types of properties is, is pretty much called the same sub something, whatever you're looking at. So in this case, if we have a subset that is a group, if we have a group and a subset that is also a group, and if we're using the same group operation, then we will go ahead and we'll call this subset actually a subgroup of the original group G. And now with this definition in hand, let's take a look at some examples. We'll start with some simple examples, and then we'll move on to some slightly more interesting examples as the slides progress. But we've seen before that the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, and the complex numbers are all in fact groups under the operation of addition. And in fact, the integers, rational numbers, and real numbers are subsets of the complex numbers. We could view them all as sitting inside uh, the largest of these collections of numbers, which is the complex numbers. And therefore, by definition, the integers, rational numbers, and real numbers are subgroups of the complex numbers. In a similar way, we've seen before that SLN of R and GLN of R, the special linear group of n by n matrices, and the general linear group of n by n matrices, let's work now under matrix multiplication. Uh, we've seen that both of these are groups before. Um, remember that R is some sort of um, number set. Here we're using either the integers mod n, the integers, the rational numbers, real numbers, or complex numbers. We've seen before that both of these collections of matrices form groups uh, under the same operation, which is matrix multiplication. And again, by definition, um, SLN of R will always be a subgroup of GLN of R. Now, another set of good examples to keep in mind is that if G is any old group in the world, we have what I would call the trivial subgroups, which are, we could view the group itself as a subgroup. Um, any set is a subset of itself. And of course, we're using the same operation, so a group is a subgroup of itself. And less, less vacuously, but vacuously still, is if we take a look at the set that just contains the identity element, this will be a subgroup of an arbitrary group G, uh, because any time you take the identity and just combine it with itself, under the group operation, you just get the identity. Um, so these two groups are often called the trivial subgroups of a group, um, but they're important to keep in mind whenever you're working on theorems, conjectures, or making broad sweeping generalizations. They're good to keep in mind when you're looking for examples and counterexamples of things that these types, these two particular uh, sets form subgroups of any group that you're looking at, something we'll talk about more later on in the slides. One that's less obvious, but an example that will be important to us as we're moving on in the semester. I like to have students sort of begin their study of group theory by making a Cayley table for D8 and taking a look at the symmetries of a square. And often they'll list the set of rotations first in their Cayley table, and one of their first observations will be that they have this nice chunk inside their Cayley table of contained um, of contained elements. They'll notice that when you take any rotation and combine it with another rotation, you just get a rotation. Uh, so oftentimes my students will see that the set of rotations seems to form a group itself. Um, so this is a nice example that you may or may not have noticed if you're just toying around with group theory. And more generally, if you're looking at any type of dihedral group, the set of rotations is going to be a subgroup of that group. And it's going to be a subgroup with a lot of nice properties that we'll talk about and discover more as we progress in the course. And last but not least on this very first page, what I'd like to say is that it's a very common mistake. Many people think that the integers mod n is a subgroup of the integers, and this is in fact not true. 
Um, and let's talk about why this is. We've seen before that the integers mod n is a group. We've seen before that the integers are a group. And certainly, the integers mod n can be viewed as a subset of the integers. So what's the problem? Why am I saying that the integers mod n is not a subgroup of the integers? Well, I'm saying that because they have different group operations. So when we're working with the integers, we're working with plain old regular arithmetic and addition. Uh, when we're working with the integers mod n, our group operation is modular addition, not plain old addition. If we were working with plain old addition, the integers mod n would not be a closed um, subset. So because we are changing the group operation, the integers mod n is not in fact a subgroup of the integers. Um, there is a relationship here. Your intuition is not wrong to recognize that there's a familiarity between these two objects, but the familiarity is not that the integers mod n is a subgroup. Uh, we'll have to get a little bit further on in the course to really understand the, relationships the relationship between z mod n, z, and the integers. Now, when you start out and you're looking at subgroups, you'll find a lot of very natural examples of subgroups of one another, some of which we covered on the previous slide. But sometimes subgroups are not very intuitive. We're not easy to spot from a Cayley table if you're looking at a finite group. And when you're dealing with an infinite group, you're not going to have that tool with you at all. So what we really need is a sturdy way of identifying when a particular subset forms a subgroup and when it doesn't. And luckily for us, what we have is what's called the two-step subgroup test. Um, the name might seem a little bit misleading from the way that I have the theorem stated. The way I have the theorem stated, I have three criteria that you must check in order to verify if a particular subset does indeed form a subgroup. So you might think it ought to be called the three-step subgroup test. Um, many books will not list the theorem the way that I have it listed here. They'll list it with two criteria. Um, however, I, I find that way to be particular mis particularly misleading, but I really do think it's called the two-step subgroup test because what is going on here is that the subset uh, of, the, of the group must satisfy two of the four criteria um, necessary to form a group, and the other two criteria are actually implied just from um, the fact that you're looking at a group and you're looking at um, these two particular criteria. So let's go through and let's figure out what we need to check in order to determine if an arbitrary subset uh, of a group indeed forms a subgroup. So here what we do is we suppose that G is a group and that H is a subset of G. Then if the following three things are satisfied, H will form a subgroup of G. So the first thing we need to check is that H is not empty. The second thing we need to check is that H is closed under the group operation, and the group operation I mean is of course the group operation of G. And last but not least, what we need to do is check that H is closed under taking inverses. If these three things are satisfied, then the subset H will actually be a subgroup of G. So now, what should we do next? Let's take a look at the proof of this. H is not empty, that first criterion, is a statement it is a set theoretic thing, so that's not really a group theoretic thing. We're just checking that H is not empty. And then the uh, criterion 2 and criterion 3, those are group theoretic properties. We're going to assume that H is closed under, under the group operation and closed under taking inverses. And what we need to do is we need to show that the other two group axioms are satisfied. So if you'll recall, that means we need to check that H actually contains the identity element. Um, that's the other one of the other things we need to check, and last but not least, we need to check that the group operation is an associative uh, operation. So let's begin by showing that H actually contains the identity element. So to begin, let's start out by picking little g to be an arbitrary element of the set H. This is where we're using that first criterion that H is not empty. Now let's use the third criterion. Let's use that because H is closed under taking inverses, uh, because G belongs to H, we know that G inverse belongs to H. That's the third criterion. And lastly, using this second criterion, we know that if G belongs to H and G inverse belongs to H, 
By assumption number two, we know that we can combine G and G inverse and that the result will also lie inside the set H. So by taking G dot G inverse, which we know happens to be the identity, that's our property of inverses, that's what it means to be the inverse of G. When we combine the two, we get the identity element, and the combination of these two things, again by property two, must belong to the set H, and that finishes showing that the identity does indeed uh, belong to our subset. So now our subset, which by assumption is closed and is closed under taking inverses, now also contains the identity element. The last thing we need to do to show that H is a group is we need to show that its group operation is associative. However, this is actually quite easy. Uh, the, group, the group operation in H must be the operation of G. That was baked into our definition of being a subgroup. Right? So the operation that we're taking a look at is the group operation of the whole big larger group G. And because we're assuming that G is a group, it must be the case that that group operation is associative. So is it associative on the elements of H? Well, yes, because it's associative on all of the group elements of G. So in particular, it's going to be associative on just some of the elements of G, the ones that lie in H. So that finishes checking that the four group axioms are satisfied, and that's the quick little proof of the two-step subgroup test. Now the last thing that I'd like to do in this very first video is I'd like to look at an early example. So what I would like to do is prove a little lemma, which is the set of even integers, which I'm going to just denote by h for convenience on this slide. Uh, this in fact forms a subgroup of the integers. In order to do this proof, what we're going to do is we're going to use this two-step subgroup test from the previous slide. Now what I wanted to do here is I'm going to go through the three criteria uh, in order. The first thing I'm going to do is show that the set of even integers is not empty. Um, you could sort of take this as a basic fact. The fact is that even integers exist. You could say 2 is even, so 2 belongs to the set H, and that would be enough to show that it's not empty. However, a very standard thing when you're using the two-step subgroup test, what, what is often the easiest thing to do is to show that your set H is not empty. It, it's often the easiest thing to show that the identity belongs to the um, belongs to the subset. So even though you don't need to show that the identity belongs to H, even though that's implied, as we saw on the previous slide, in order to check the non-empty part of the two-step subgroup test, it's often easiest to show that the identity belongs to the subset H. So that's how I chose to proceed here. I said first, we're going to show that the set H is non-empty, uh, and I said zero is an even number, so zero belongs to H, and that's enough to show that it's non-empty. We found at least one element sitting inside this set, so we've got the non-empty criteria satisfied. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is demonstrate that the set H, the set of even integers, is closed under addition. Again, this is a basic fact of, of arithmetic that most people feel comfortable with. If I take two even numbers, and I combine them with my group operation, my group operation here is addition, if I take an even number and an even number and I add them together, I get an even number. So that's checking that we're closed under addition informally. What I've written here on the slide is very formally. I said let's suppose that I have two elements in the set H and I named them G and H. The next thing I did is I said because G and H belong to the set of even integers, what that means by definition is that G is a multiple of 2 and H is a multiple of 2. Now let's introduce some notation for that. Let's write G as 2 times K and H is 2 times L, where K and L are just arbitrary, whatever integers I need to write G and H in this manner. It follows that if I take G plus H and I use substitution, G, remember, is 2K and H is 2L. So then G plus H is 2K plus 2L, and what I can do is I can factor out that 2 from the sum. So I can write 2K plus 2L as 2 times the quantity K plus L. And what I've done is I've taken g plus k and as I've written it as two times an integer. That means that g plus h is even and g plus h belongs to big H. And that's what it means for h to be closed. I start out by taking two elements that belong there and I show that when I combine them under the group operation that they also belong to h. So that checks off criterion 2 from the two-step subgroup test. 
And the last thing that I need to do is show that h is closed under taking inverses. So let's suppose that little g belongs to the set h. And let's continue with the same notation that we used previously for closure. Let's write g as 2 times k. Because that's what it means to be an even integer, where 2, uh, where 2 times some integer. Well, what is g inverse? I've written g inverse just as a symbol. Uh, we're working with addition here, and inverse means to put a negative sign in front. So if g is written as 2k, then g inverse is negative 2k. And if I just sort of change where that negative sign lies, and instead of writing it as negative 2k, I write it as 2 times the quantity negative k, uh, then this is, ne if k is an integer, negative k is an integer, and I've taken g inverse and I've written it as 2 times an integer. Again, by definition, that means that um, g inverse belongs to h, and that's what it means to be closed under taking integer, uh, closed under taking inverses, excuse me. So those are the three things that we needed to check by the two-step subgroup test. We've checked them all, and each one of them is satisfied. So by the two-step subgroup test, h is a subgroup of z.